It's the Holy Spirit doing the work within you. However, however, this does not occur automatically in the sense that salvation does not occur automatically. It occurs when we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit. And that's really what I'm talking about. Importance of yielding, surrendering yourself to the work that God wants to do in you. Okay. So, conviction is a work of the Holy Spirit. Not so long ago, I preached about convicting grace. It's a mark of the grace of God that we are convicted. You know, the Lord Jesus said that in John 16, verse 8, that when the Holy Spirit was going to come, that he was going to reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. So, the Holy Spirit reproves us. He tells us, look... It's not right the way that you are living in your sin. When you come to Christ, it's one of the first things that becomes apparent. We are convicted and convinced of sin. We're convinced that we're a sinner, aren't we? If you've not been convicted of that, if you've not been convinced of that fact this morning, please come and see me after the service. Because I don't believe that God can do a work in your heart until you see yourself as you truly are which is a sinner guilty before God. In fact, the Apostle Paul said, by the law is the knowledge of sin, Romans 3.20. When we look at God's law, it shows us that we have, what, fallen short, doesn't it? Fallen short of that mark, that we therefore failed in keeping God's law. So it's by the law is the knowledge of sin. That sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Romans 7 verse 13 says. So by the law we see sin as it truly is. That all the world may become guilty before God. Romans 3.19. So you get the picture. It's the law, the word of God that brings conviction to us by the action of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we see through that that the commandment becomes to me, uh, you know, I become exceedingly sinful. I see just, just how bad my sin is. Is and then because of of that word, because of the law of God, all the world becomes guilty before God. There's no one who can say, "Well, I'm all right, you know, Jack. I, I'm okay. I'm, I'm quite a good person." The law of God is, is is there to show you, no, you're not actually a good person, and you need Jesus Christ. You need to hear the gospel that's going to set you free. Is that clear to everybody? I've made, hopefully, made that as clear as I can. Once you know what God's moral law requires, and we can sum it up as Jesus did in Matthew 22, 37, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, then we see that our sins are no longer uh, inconsequential. They are no longer you know, just little mistakes that we did, and it's not, not really that bad. But we start to see that they are actually gross affronts to a holy God. Okay? They're actually really awful, really terrible things. And, uh, you know, and yet, you know, even realizing that, sin still drives us, doesn't it? It doesn't stop driving you or pushing you to do those sins. In fact, it, it, it drives, us, drives us ever more furiously into those sins. That, that even straining power still continues to work within us and therefore we become desperate, we, we, we become beside ourselves, you know, I try and, I, I now see what the problem is, but the problem hasn't gone away, has it? The problem is still there, we're just more conscious of it now. The disguise that sin once had has been removed. Let me share with you this quote. Ralph Venning is not that well known, one of the early English Puritans, and I like what he says here, yea, exceeding sinful sin, not in a disguise as it is when committed, but in its own lively colours, or as we should more appropriately say, <coughs> its dead and deadly colours. I like that. He's saying, you know, look, when, when you know the law of God, when you know what God's word says, suddenly the disguise of sin is taken away. All the self-justification. Well, it was okay for me to get angry at that person and to shout at them. It was okay. I'm self-justified. It was okay for me to get drunk. I had a really bad week. It was okay for me to do this and this. That's taken away, isn't it? 
It's taken, the disguise is removed and actually we see sin for what it really is. Something uh, vile, something monstrous. That's what sin is, that's what it produces in a person, isn't it? Its tentacles are into every area of our life. It touches and taints everything. This kind of uh, evil is just not acceptable in the Christian life. Okay. Now, I'm not saying that people don't struggle with this. What I'm saying is there must be some, something must be done about this. We can't just allow it to exist. This monster existing in our lives and controlling our lives and gripping parts of our lives and do nothing about it. It's not an acceptable standard at all. You know, there's a man called J.D. Drysdale, a great preacher, and I love what he says here. He says, God has only one standard for his people, holiness unto the Lord. That's the standard. Okay? That's the standard. Holiness unto the Lord. Now, I am well aware that what I'm preaching on here, you know, in, in many churches up and down the country would be regarded as the ramblings of, of some old dinosaur, you know, it's just not being preached in the majority of churches. But you saw how fundamental it was. I'm going to look a little bit further in a moment what the Bible says about sin. You know, those preachers of the past, those old guys, they touched on this all, all the time. Sanctification, holiness, leading a clean, holy and obedient life before God. Let me emphasize again, not through your own efforts. You will fail, and you will fail miserably <laughs> when you try that. Rather, it is yielding to the Holy Spirit, the work that He wants to do and can do in you. Do you believe He can do that work? Do you believe He can do a sanctifying work within you? Yes, He can. You need to step your, allow your faith to step up to that next level and believe. You know, there's an old hymn that says, ponder anew what the Almighty can do. I mean, some of us need to ponder and you say, hey, you know, I, I, God can do this within me. Why not in me? Yeah. J.C. Ryle, great, great man of God, you know. This is what he says. A regeneration. Being regenerated is being born again, right? A regeneration which men can have and yet live carelessly in sin or worldliness is a regeneration invented by uninspired theologians but never mentioned in scripture. Wow, what a broadside. <laughs> I'm glad he said that. Uh, yeah, makes you think, doesn't it, really? He's saying, look, are you born again? Then you need to understand what it really means to be born again. To be a Christian is to live this holy life. Okay. Conviction is the first step. When you feel convicted of your sin, then God can do something with you. When you say, yeah, it's bad, and yes, it is that bad, then God can do something. And what we need to do, the second step there that we mentioned was renunciation. To renounce something is to formally declare one's abandonment of a thing. So talking about abandoning something, <coughs> having done with it, say, that's it, I've had enough of it, I'm done with it. I'm no longer going to let it be part of my life. Again, Isaiah 55, verse 7 and 8, what's one of my favorite scriptures? Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy on him. God wants to have mercy on you this morning for your sins. He wants to forgive them. But it involves you forsaking, giving them up, turning away from them, abandoning them, renouncing those, those sins. Okay, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 1 says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted 
that the Lord is gracious. There's the grace of God doesn't appear in there. But what grace? What is grace for? It's there that we might be victorious over sin. It is not there that we might turn the grace of our God into the lasciviousness. We've been looking at in Jude, haven't we? In men's uh, Bible study there. That's not what grace is for. It's that we might be more than conquerors through Him that loved us. You know. Now Peter tells us that we are to lay aside five specific uh, things. Five things. All malice, all guile, hypocrisy, envy, and all evil speakings. Notice the repetition of the word all. This is very thorough. What is malice? Malice literally translated as badness. All badness. Okay, and we're to lay it aside. You know, the Apostle Paul talked about the leaven of malice and wickedness in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 8. Do you know how much leaven is needed to, to leaven or to rise the whole batch of bread? Do you, do you need lots and lots of leaven or you just need a tiny little bit? Just a small amount, isn't it? And, you know, in the, in the, under the Old Testament, the Jews had this... Uh, uh, um, what would you call it? This custom of they used to hide uh, yeast or leaven in the house, and these and they had this 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 custom where they'd go around and find all the yeast and put it out of the house. Uh, it's a picture of sin. So you go into all the different corners and you, you dig it out, get the yeast all out, get it out, or lay it aside. Okay, and that's what you need to do as a Christian is is, is just you know go through your life which. Sure that you've got that sin out of those areas. Examine yourself, as the Apostle Paul says. You know. All malice. And put it off and lay it aside. Guile. Guile. What's guile? That is deceitful words. Flattering uh, words. Dishonest words. The Bible says, keep thy tongue from evil. And thy lips from speaking guile. Psalm 34, verse 13. If you're in a church situation, you're, you're going through the most terrible time that you've ever had in your life, and someone says to you, How are you doing? And you say, Oh, I'm absolutely fine, thank you. Yes, I'm, I, everything, everything all right? Oh, yeah, 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 it's great. Is that, is that being honest? No. No, that is speaking guile. I want you to see these. You know, acceptable middle class niceties are actually not that at all. They are falsehood. They're not being real with other people. That's why your brothers and sisters in Christ are there to help you, to bear your burdens. If you won't let them bear your burdens, you're not being honest. You're not being real with them. I know this takes trust. But please see, this is what we are called to live like as Christians. You know, you know. Living as a Christian, it's not, you know, uh, uh, just putting on a mask on a Sunday and, be, and appearing to be a certain way and saying, yeah, I've got a religion. It's your life. It's your soul, your life, your all, all of you are. It must be real. These are not inconsequential things. These are really important things. James says, confess your faults one to another. James 5, 16. Part of being... Christian. Hypocrisies. Notice that the word, by the way, is plural. There are multiple hypocrisies in our lives. Not just a hypocrisy of religion, but hypocrisy of friendship in terms of fellowship. Lots of different areas where we can be guilty of hypocrisy. What's the antidote for this? Ephesians 4.15 says, speaking the truth in Love. There's the antidote to those hypocrisies. Speaking the truth in love. See it here in context. But speaking the truth in love, uh, that we may grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. Or to put it in another way, just to take those, the, the, the paraphrasing, the, the important parts there, to grow up into Christ. Now, if that sounds a little bit heretical, please don't take it like that. What it means is to grow up and to be just like 
Christ, that our attitude would be the same as his with regard to doing a father's will. He voluntarily and gladly did his father's will, didn't he? The same is required of us, and we need to grow up into that. He loved his neighbor, he loved his enemies, and we need to grow up into being that kind of Christian. You know, many of us should have grown up years ago. Can I say that? Can I get away with that? We're not where we should be today as a Christian. You know, God does not expect the same of someone who's been a Christian two weeks as he does of someone who's been a Christian 20 years. There should be growth there. We're going to see how that growth occurs. And if it is lacking, what you or I can do about it. That we may grow up in Christ. Pursuing holiness is about growing, isn't it? And the idea that, that Peter says here of laying aside, laying aside all these things, the idea is like as, as if you've got a garment. I want you to imagine this. Maybe you've got uh, this really old coat, right? And it's sort of got holes in it and it's dirty, greasy. Do you know the kind of thing I mean? And, and it, 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 frankly, it smells pretty bad. Uh, uh, but you insist on, on wearing it. You're always wearing it. And, and actually, you think it's all right. You think it's okay. Because you're so used to it. You're used to the smell and you're used to the feel of it and everything. Uh, and so you think it's okay. But as you walk past, you know, people can kind of smell, smell it on you. Some can even see it, right? They can see it. They can smell it on you. But you don't see it yourself because you never bother looking in the mirror, right? And then one day, you look in the mirror, you look in the mirror of God's Word, right? James says the Word, it's like a mirror. When you look in it, you see yourself as you are, and suddenly, you're reading God's Word, and you see the real you reflected. You see that awful, <coughs> awful coat, and you look at yourself in the mirror, and you think, oh my goodness, that is disgusting. That's unacceptable. It's appalling. There's the conviction of the Holy Spirit coming upon you. You see yourself as you really are. What should you do? Should you try and, try and clean it up a bit? Try and, try and make it look better? No, it's, it's far beyond that. It's beyond hope. What should you do with it? Should you go and hang it up in the wardrobe or maybe just wear it on certain occasions? When Put it in the bin. Okay? <laughs> Throw it away. Throw it away. That's what Peter is saying. Lay aside that thing. What do we sing in that hymn? Lay aside the garments that are stained by sin. That is what God is calling us to do. Isaiah 61 verse 10 says, He hath clothed me with garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. You don't put that on over a filthy coat. Get rid of the coat. You've got new garments now in Christ. You've got new things to wear that are pure and clean and bright. Zechariah 3 verse 4 says, Take away the filthy garments from him. I will clothe thee with change of raiment. God has got something else for you to wear. He's got something else. You know, uh, all the things that we looked at in that list there, envying, evil speaking, or, or, or backbiting, as it puts it, Romans 1.30, these are sure evidence that malice, guile, hypocrisies and everything still lie in the heart. They're still in the heart. I've not been laid aside. Since those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and Jesus says, and they defile the man, they make you unclean, Matthew 15, 18. They make us unclean, therefore lay them aside. We don't want them. We've got something new to wear now. A garment of salvation. Yeah? We have been consecrated. Consecrated to the work of the Lord. The dictionary definition is this. A solemn, serious dedication to a special service or purpose. Is that how you describe your Christianity? Is it solemn? Is it serious? 
Have you dedicated yourself now to Christ and his cause? You know, the Bible talks a lot about being sober, being sober-minded, particularly for younger people to be sober-minded, not be frivolous anymore, but rather focused on these things. What did the Apostle Paul talk about when I was a child? Born as a child, I spoke as a child. And I became a man, I put childish things behind me. We need to grow up as Christians, don't we? Uh, and we need to take seriously the things of the Lord. We have a charge to keep. Leviticus 8.35 says, God has charged us with a responsibility to take the gospel out, hasn't it? To share it with those that don't know Christ. Therefore, because we've got such a serious responsibility on our shoulders... We need to start taking our own lives and our personal life, even our thought life, seriously. Because we have an enemy. We have an enemy. We have uh, somebody who is opposing us in every way possible that he can. He wants our demise. He wants our death. He will not win. Jesus Christ has a victory already, praise God. He won the victory on the cross. He said, it is finished. But whether we will enter into that victory, that depends upon whether you will yield to the Holy Spirit of God. We need to grow up. How do we grow? How do we, how do we grow up as Christians? How do we grow up into this holiness? We must desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby, Peter said to me. We've got to desire the sincere milk of the word. Do you desire the word of God? Have you ever tried to separate a baby from its milk? Have you ever tried that when the baby, the baby want, wants that milk and you say, well, I'll just, I'll just hold on a bit. It's too soon. Too soon for the child to have their feed now. I'll, 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 I'll leave it another half hour or something. You have never seen fury like that. Uh, you, you, you do so at your peril. I'm telling you, they, they will scream the house down. The people say, well, what's the matter with that child? Uh, the child needs feeding. <laughs> and, and that's the, the picture here that Peter's giving, saying, you look, should love the word of God so much. You're like a child with that point. I've got to have it. I've got to have it. I've got to feed. I can't be separated from it. That's the desire that we should have within us <clears throat> for the word of God. Do you have that desire within you? You know, this is what I say. When people say, oh, so-and-so saved, they've become a Christian. You know what I'm looking for? That desire for the Word of God, that desire to read His Word, to grow, and to feed just like an infant feeds on milk. What has this got to do with, with holiness and with sanctification? Well, Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth, thy Word is truth, John 17, verse 17. One of the means by which we can grow into that holiness is to be found in the Word of God, still understanding it, reading it, memorizing it. Let it be part of your uh, life. And it must be by faith. We must do it by faith. You know, there is something, a phrase that is used called spiritual fatalism. Anyone heard of that before? I said, I've not heard of this. Spiritual fatalism. What it is, is basically saying, no, it's not for me. It's, it's, you know, I, I, I can't do this. It's just too, it's too difficult for me. It's too hard for me. I'm just not kidding. It's not for me. It's for other people, but it's just not for me, this, this walking uh, uh, in sanctification, walking in holiness. I'm just too bad. I can never do it. You know, John Piper, and let's be fair, he's not someone I often quote, but uh, uh, John Piper said this, this spiritual fatalism is a feeling that genetic forces and family forces and the forces of my past experiences and present circumstances are just too strong to allow me to ever change. So that's the feeling some people have. They look back on their past Christian life and say, well, it never worked then, I, I never achieved it then, it's never going to work for me. Let me say again, you don't do it. You're not doing it. It's the Holy Spirit of God who is bringing that holiness. It's, it's the Holy Spirit of God who brings that sanctification. That's why he's called the Holy 
Spirit because he brings holiness into your heart, into your life. Sanctification is his work. That's what he does. And it is you yielding, surrendering to the Spirit of God that will bring that about in your life. There are means that you can use the Word of God, prayer and so on, but it is really the Holy Spirit who is doing that in you. Don't be cheated. Don't allow the devil to rob you of walking in true holiness. Rather, allow God to do that work within you. Allow God to do it. Oh well, you know, I've got, I've just got a simple faith. And people say, I, I've just got a simple faith. I'm going to be quite harsh now. Let me give you a translation. I've got a simple faith. Translation, I never bother studying the Bible. It's like when people say, oh she's got a quiet faith. Translation, she never shares the gospel with anybody. Jesus Christ died for you. He shed his blood for you. He gave you his Holy Spirit. Not so that you could spend the rest of your days uh, sinning, asking for forgiveness, sinning, asking for forgiveness, sinning, and so on. Like this great wheel of, of uh, you know, like in Judges, in the book of Judges, they have what they call the wheel of apostasy. Where the tribes, they fall into idolatry. And God sends a prophet. They repent. Uh, they get right with God. They fall into idolatry. And the wheel goes on and on and on through the book of Judges. Christ died so that we could have something better. We have a better covenant. We have a greater measure of the spirit of God today. In, under the new covenant. You know? And, and, and the, the fact is that many of us are just not really seeing that. And not using that. To be victorious in our own lives. Mm. Now, what, what I don't want to say is, you know, sometimes you get people who listen to this kind of sermon and go, yeah, I hope she's listening. You know, I hope he's listening to this. I, just, I saw it I saw it in my life out. You know, I hope they're listening. Again, that's not good enough. We are here to bear one, another, one another's burdens, aren't we? We're here to help one another. You should be thinking in your mind, yeah, that's right. I'm going to help everybody that I know to do that. I'm going to help everybody I'm in fellowship with to walk in holiness, to encourage their own sanctification, to come alongside, to be there for them, to set some time aside. If I see them struggling, I'll meet up with them. I'll have a chat with them. I'll encourage them. I'll pray with them. I'll get involved in the fellowship and try and help them. That's what we need to do as Christian brothers and sisters, isn't it? Is, is, is be our brother's keeper. I'll say, what, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. <laughs> yes, you are your brother's keeper, and so am I. Therefore, that's what we need to do. We are called unto holiness. We're called unto holiness. There's an old hymn, and with this I'm going to finish. And I just want to read you the words of this hymn. It says, called unto holiness... Children of light, walking with Jesus in garments of white, raiment unsullied, not tarnished with sin, God's Holy Spirit abiding within. Called unto holiness, praise his dear name, this blessed secret to faith now made plain. Not our own righteousness, but Christ within, living and reigning and saving from sin. I hope you'll take that thought home with you this morning. And I hope you'll pray about it. And I pray that it would really change your life and really equip you to follow Christ and experience him in a new and exciting way in a deeper way just remember take off that vile raiment that garment that dirty coat take it off and lay it aside because he has given you new garments garments of salvation let's pray